2005. And we appreciate the good devotional service. The Lord's pouring out his blessing upon us, and we just want to be uh, worthy recipients, I suppose, for lack of a better way of saying it. When we look out over the world and we see all the problems that are going on, there's really not much to be happy about. <laughs> Amen. Thank God we can always take a look at our own lives and got something to be very thankful for. And we don't know where we would be were it not for God. Or how we would be, for that matter. Amen. But God has been very good and gracious to us, and we certainly appreciate that. I'd like for you to turn your Bibles, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 26. It's the time of the year when... We find ourselves reflecting on the resurrection of Christ and what Christianity truly means. It's a religion that's and an experience that separates itself from all others in that the adherents believe firmly, convincing, convinced uh, beyond uh, any shadow of a doubt that their founder, their originator, died and then came back to life. Not only did he come back to life, but he ascended up in heaven and is there fully able and capable and willing to extend that same life to every soul that comes to him. Our Heavenly Father, we look to you this day. The next few moments, we ask you, Lord, to bless your word. You know each soul is gathered here, and you know the purpose of our meeting. We ask you, great God, that only you would be glorified. May these thoughts be of worth, eternal worth, in the name of Jesus. May we say nothing that would be an obstruction or hindrance to any soul that's here. That was only to speak what you would have us to in Jesus' name. Make it plain and understandable. And, oh God, we ask you to remember the altar service that... The souls be pricked and make their way to thee. That's what we're after, Lord. See souls saved. Bless now and have your way. In Jesus' name, we beat the devil. Lord, as we were speaking not long ago, he's here. He comes to church all the time. Never misses. My God, we pray a rebuke against him. We ask you to help us. Lord, we stand against him in all his work. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. In Matthew 26, there's a very remarkable story that begins to unfold. As Jesus had been in the Garden of Gethsemane, and one of his disciples had decided to betray him, sell him for some small amount, 30 pieces of silver, if my recollection serves me right. And immediately following this event, there was a great unfolding of other events which climaxed in the crucifixion of the Messiah. All along we realized that the Bible, these records are given for our admonition and our learning. And to be sure that anytime something of such great magnitude takes place, there's always many attitudes and many feelings and many thoughts, many positions that people have and take. And what I'd like to do this fine Sunday is to see if, by the grace of the living God, we can help you locate yourself in this crowd. There were five different kinds of people gathered together that day outside of Messiah. Each one was different, sometimes converging, sometimes very much opposing positions with respect to this event. But they were all gathered there. Possibly in Jerusalem about that time, there was somewhere around a quarter to a half million people or so. 
quite a few, more than there is today in this building. But be, one, be it known unto one and all that the same kinds of attitudes that existed back then still exist today. And a lot of people have varying degrees of appreciation or disdain for Christianity and its founder, Christ. There are some that feel one way or another, and I say again unto you that all of these attitudes can be found in this crowd on that fateful day. Let's look over here in Matthew 26. We'll begin reading verse number 57. Then we'll read a couple of other verses and we'll take a look at one group. Matthew 26, verse 57. The Bible says, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. 62 through 68. Same chapter. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answers thou nothing? They had been interrogating Christ, running a little inquiry with him, and he didn't really respond in the way they wanted him to. They, wanted, they were really trying to provoke him. And his, he was so control, and so much in control of his spirit that they couldn't uh, prevail. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answers thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses, these witness against thee? And remember, they had hired some of these people that witnessed against him. They had paid them money to attest to certain things. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure, I command thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you hereafter, Shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? Then the high priest rent his clothes. He tore his clothes. He's pretty hot. Pretty upset. He kind of was in a rage, if you'll pardon the expression. He lost it. He flipped out. He went ballistic. He went into a tizzy. He got ticked off. You know all the terms we use today. The Bible says, the high priest rent his clothes, tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? The first group I want to speak to you about in that crowd were the scribes, the Pharisees, and the religious leaders. Their attitude was one that was pretty simple to discern. They were openly antagonistic. They were openly opposed to Christ. There were no two ways about it. They hated him. They despised him. They conspired against him. They are the ones that paid Judas Iscariot to go off and tell who he was and to betray him. They are the ones that accepted the money when Judas tried to return it back to them. And these are the ones that hired people and accused him of things that they themselves knew were not really true. Amen. In this country, in this state, in this city, and perhaps in this room, there are people not unlike the Pharisees. The one of all the people on earth, the Pharisees should have been the one taking up for him. They had been trained and raised and instilled with the, the uh, Old Testament law. They knew that Christ was coming. They knew the prophecies. They had a clear understanding that someday Messiah was on his way. And of all the people, of all the folks in this crowd, these people should have been there to protect and defend the Christ of Calvary. They were 
his own people. They were those who had grown up around him. They were those who he had spent time with and had seen his miracles and his working. They knew his family and his family's family. They were people who knew the Bible, knew the word of God, knew what it was that God was requiring. They knew all about these various rituals and cleansings and offering of lambs and bullocks and goats. They were the ones that prayed for people. They were the ones that went out and did all the religious duties. They were the ones that taught, not only knew, but taught God's word. And yet, in spite of all of that, when you look at their attitude toward Messiah, it was one of rebellion and fighting. It's sad to say, friend, but it hadn't changed. The general religious world out there fights against Christ. It might sound like a very strange thing to you, but it's the truth as God is my witness. The majority of people who call themselves Christian don't even know what it means to be a Christian. In fact, it's so bad that the majority of people that call themselves Christians are in the way of honest people who would be Christians. Amen. They're openly fighting against this notion of living above sin. They rebel against that. They contest you on every side. Brother, if you have any kind of inclination toward holiness, brother, that, that just raises their ire. Think about this for a minute. These people are supposed to be the defenders of Christ, and the Bible says when Jesus got before them, they hired people, they said they suborned people to testify and lie against him. Well, shouldn't that be a fundamental tenet of any religion that you don't lie? Huh? Let alone pay somebody to tell a lie? Furthermore, to pay somebody to tell a lie on a man that's innocent? And not guilty of what you're accusing him of? How crazy is that? How unfair is that? I wonder if you see yourself in the crowd here. You know, people get accused of having a pharisaical spirit. Sometimes they even accuse that we, we like this and that, but they want, the attitudes of the Pharisees was to get rid of Jesus. We want more of him. Amen. When you look out over your life and you consider what you've been doing, you have to ask yourself, am I in opposition openly to God? These people are the ones that, or some of the ones that spit on him. That's tough. The high priests, those people that are supposed to be defending him and they're spitting on him. And you know they weren't, you know that was a disgusting thing. I, think, I don't think anybody in here would appreciate someone spitting on them deliberately. That, that's enough to make somebody want to fight. And yet, here we have these religious people, the religious leaders who are conspiring fighting, warring, and accusing, and spitting, and beating him, all in the name of God. You know, it's more to being a Christian than going to church, reading your Bible two or three times a day, and saying a prayer every now and again. It's more to it than that. Christianity is a way of life. Christianity is an experience as much as it is what we call a religion, in fact, more so. Because everybody's claiming, I mean, not everybody, but you know what I'm saying. And generally speaking, general uh, people, the general population says, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. We call ourselves a Christian nation. And we're so far away from Christian principles, we, call, we can't hardly recognize them when they come. We think they're foreign and ridiculous. Amen. Amen. This crowd consisted of many people who call themselves religious, call themselves saved, call themselves accepted of God. And they were nowhere near such a condition you know in an audience this size it's hard to believe there's not somebody out there like that if I were to spend a lot of time on some of the issues that we that the Bible uh, teaches against and we adhere to there'd be some people who would be ready to fight me figuratively speaking of course why you shouldn't be acting like that you should be going there you shouldn't be drinking that you shouldn't be doing that and there's religious people who are doing it all the time and so therefore, because religious people do it, they think it's okay. You know? They think it's all right. The preacher does it, they think it's okay to do it. 
Man, every preacher that call himself a Christian is not a Christian. In fact, let me take it one step further. Most, most Christian ministers, uh, ministers that call themselves a Christian, aren't saved at all and never have been. All they did was go to school, got a diploma or a degree of some sort, and all they've done is going out and start a little work, preaching this and that, but they don't even know what it means to have their sins washed away. They don't know what it means to be able to pray to Almighty God and to have a fellowship with Him. They have no idea what that means. They don't know what it means to sit down and read the Word of God and have it come alive to them. They don't know what that means. They don't know what it means to know the thrill of having all their sins washed away and be born again and then sanctified holy. They don't know what that means. All they've done is come to church once, maybe one Easter Sunday, and have the preacher stand up and say, I open doors to the church. And all the doors come open. They got it. And then he stands up and says, come on down if you want to be, uh, become part of the church. And people walk down and then they recite some little prayers that are written down. And then they baptize them that evening. That's all they know. And as a result of that, they think they're really saved. And then when the real gospel comes, they fight against it and they war against it and they contest it. Listen, let me say this. The Bible tells us that, they, that God is concerned about everything that has to do with life and godliness. Everything that has to do with our life he's concerned about. He's concerned about how we talk. He's concerned about how we dress. He's concerned about how we eat, how we sleep, where we go, what we read, what we look at, man, what kind of relationships we have. He's concerned about everything that has to do with you. And dear one, if you have a religion, that you lay down to do certain things, you don't have Christianity. Amen. Amen. Saints don't lay the religion down. Dear one, we are what our religion. And our religion is what we are. We're defined by living a life of holiness in Christ Jesus. And if we lay this down, we're no longer Christians. We're sinners again. In this crowd were probably thousands of people who had been persuaded by, by the scribes and the Pharisees to become one of them. And they warred against the very Savior who they were looking for at the time. Their expectations were high. The Messiah one day is going to deliver us from these people. But when he came to deliver them, they killed him. And they didn't kill him because he was a desperado. They didn't kill him because he was robbing banks. They didn't get rid of Jesus because he was raping all the women in town. They didn't get rid of Jesus because he had a crack outlet. They didn't kill him because he was using speed and, 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 and teaching people how to smoke cigarettes. They didn't kill him because of that, right? They didn't kill him because he was out there and, and, and trying to t tell all the men they could go with each other and tell all the women they could go with each other. They didn't kill him because of that, did they? They didn't kill him because he was trying to use psychology on people and take advantage of them and take their money. He didn't do that. He wasn't murdering people and stealing their money. They didn't kill him because of that. They killed him because they despised his message. They killed him because when he came and preached to them, he condemned what they were doing and they didn't like it. They killed him because they saw that he not only preached the word of God, but he lived it. And he said, if I can live it, you can live it. And they didn't like it. They killed him because he began to preach God's word and people began to listen to it and they started following him instead of them. That's why they did it. The one the world's the same today. There's been no change. In the crowds we have now, dear one, they don't call them scribes and Pharisees. They got other names for them. They got all kinds of sectarian names. And I'm not going to go through them this morning. I don't need to. You know them. Right down the street you can see them. There are more churches than we can than the law allows. You can't between now and a in ten minutes drive, right here in Springfield. You can probably go in any direction. You can probably run up to about three, four, five different churches. And a lot of them are gathered right now. They had early morning service, they had late night service, and they're going through all these things along with their Easter egg hunts and 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 bunny rabbits. And they've completely forgotten what this day was supposed to celebrate or commemorate or remind us of. And if you get to talking about their Easter eggs and, and bunnies, they'll get mad at you. 
They'll think that, well, we're the one that's old fuddy-duddies and stodgy and all stuck up. This day wasn't left aside here to commemorate Easter bunnies. I'm not saying the original Easter is, is all that. Don't misunderstand me, but I'm saying if we're gonna, if folks are gonna do it, we don't want to do it because of Peter Cottontail. <laughs> Am I right? We're not trying to do it because of Br'er Rabbit. Amen. Bugs Bunny and the rest of them. Amen. Amen. In that crowd, we had a group of people that hated Christ openly and did what they could to get rid of him. That's the first group. If you find yourself in this group, everybody in the group needed help. Everybody in the crowd needed help. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find you. I'm trying to help you find yourself. Where are you? You in the crowd. Yes, you were. We all were. Not literally, of course, but in spirit. <laughs> Amen. Romans, excuse me, Matthew 27 and 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Verse 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto him, Whom will he that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy... They had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will you that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? Now, here's one group, our first group, and they're influencing our next group. We've got in this great swelling outside there in Jerusalem, in this crowd, not only are there scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders, but there's also the authorities, the Roman governor, the soldiers, and those that are in charge of civil obedience. And these people were a little different than the, Roman so than the, uh, than the scribes and Pharisees. These people were very conflicted, a tad bit confused, and easily influenced. They were looking out for their political position. They had something at stake here. Not the same as the Jews did. A little different. And as a result of them having something at stake, they allowed themselves to kind of be pushed around and maneuvered when all this was going on. Amen. If you were following me when I read this a few moments ago, Pilate was the one that was in charge at the time. It was left up to him. It kept getting kicked back. They, they bantered about back and forth. They sent him to Herod. They sent him to Herod. And finally it wound up at, her, at Pilate's feet. Now Pilate tried hard to get out of it. <laughs> he proclaimed his innocence, being Christ. And then proclaimed his own innocence by washing his hands. Remember that? He said, I don't want the blood of this just man on my hand. And the Bible said he washed his hands in front of the multitude. And not too much different than what we have today. There are plenty of people, probably some right here in this audience, that really aren't too sure what they should do about Jesus. They, there's some here that really would be saved. But, you know, there's some influences that have been working on them. And they're afraid that if they get saved, these influences will not be the same. Or perhaps the relationships that they've had will have to be severed. Or, or, or the places that they're going, they won't be able to, they got something at stake, you know. And it makes them feel a little uncomfortable because they really feel like, really, salvation is really the best thing. I really should be a part of it. But, you know, if I do that, then I'm, I'm going to have to give up a few things. Maybe, maybe Caesar won't look on me the same way. 
Maybe the people over here in, in, in Tibet or wherever, they won't view me in the same light. Maybe there's a few friendships and a few uh, uh, linkings that I have now that, that, that will be taken away. And, and I'm not really ready to do that. And so, this group, this group, though conflicted and confused, allow themselves to kind of be pushed along by the other group. Pilate asked this question, and, and, and believe me, when he asked this question, I believe he was asking out of sincerity of his own soul. He said, why? What evil hath he done? Down in Pilate's soul, he was saying, you know what? There's really nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with him. He's really done nothing wrong. Why are you all so bound and bent and determined to do this to him? Why, why can't you allow me to just whip him a little bit? I mean, we spit on him, we, we plant, you know, put the uh, crown of thorns on him. Let, 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 can't we just do that? Beat him and then, and then, and then let him go? I mean, some people, if they, if they could have the world and have Christ both, they'd have been saved years ago. If they could have maintained their influence and all the other things that God seems to be trying to get away from them, if they could do that and still call themselves Christians, they'd have been saved years ago. Amen. There's some people, brother, if they could just have figured out a way to be worldly and holy at the same time, they'd have done it. They would have said there's nothing wrong with Jesus and there's nothing wrong with the world either. So let's just have fun. We'll do them both. And they'd have gone on their merry way. But what confuses and conflicts them, what causes them so much agony and pain, they got to make a decision. Yeah. Amen. There's a choice they have to make. And that choice, my friends, is, 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 is heart-rending. Because the things they have to separate from, they truly love and desire. But they know God's a better way. But they don't want to give it up. So they're torn between. And they're torn between. And then there's the rest pushing, pushing. You know, if, if you do that, you're not a friend of Caesar if you say you, you're, he's a king. You're not a friend of Caesar. And the scale was tipped. Now, he tried real hard to get out of the responsibility about washing his hand, but it didn't resolve him of any of his guilt. You can try to wash your hands of this thing. You can probably say, well, I won't go to any other church, and I won't join this, and I won't do that, and I'll just wait. But the one, you're still guilty if you're not serving him. Amen. Amen. They forced him to make a decision. God brought him to a point of decision where you have to decide. He said, which one, do you, which one should I give? Which one should I give? And when, Barat, when, 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 when Pilate was making that decision, the one, he was making the same decision himself. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah, he, could have, he could have said, I'm not releasing Christ. He's innocent. He could have said that. But he didn't want to take that responsibility on himself. He was concerned about the tumult out there. He was concerned about the aftermath. He was concerned about what he might have to face. It seemed like a little bit too much for him. So what did he say? He said, you all make the decision and I'll do it. But then he tried hard to, to change their mind. But they said, oh, no, we're not having that. Give us Barabbas. And when he released Barabbas on those people, he released Barabbas on himself. Amen. You got to make a decision, friend. I had to make one. Everyone in here that's saved had to make a decision. There's a point that comes in your life where when you honestly and forthrightly look at it, you have to decide, do I want to continue the way I am? Do I want to continue with what I'm doing or do I want to be saved? Am I willing to give up all of this for salvation? Amen. And you've got to weigh that in the balance. You've got to say, what do I gain if I stay out here in the world? The Bible said... It'll profit a man nothing if he gained the whole world. Whatever you want, if you get it, if it's at your beck and call, you can have your heart's consent. He said, you, don't, you haven't gained a thing if you get it all and you lose Christ. But on the other side, he said, if you gain Christ, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you lose the whole world and get Christ, you've got everything. You don't miss out on anything. Because you've got this world that's conquered at your feet and heaven to go to. Amen. You're in the crowd, friend. You say, I wasn't a scribe or a Pharisee. But you're like a Roman soldier. 
You're like the civil authorities. You know, those soldiers could all, all they had to say was, I was just doing what I was told to do. I mean, that's, that's a real easy thing. I, I, I was just doing what, I was just following orders. There wasn't some time when a moral good said you don't follow orders. Amen. Listen, you say, well, that sounds real weird, brother. I'm, I'm telling you. In the Nazi war camps, right? You know, you know your history. In the Nazi war camp, we've never let a single one of those individuals off. Because they said they were following orders. We never said, well, that's okay, you're following orders. And because the Fuhrer said you had to do it, it was okay. We've never said that. We've always said, if you get orders and you know those orders are wrong, then you don't follow those orders. But the world's pressing in. The religious world's pressing in. The devil's pressing in. And here you are saying, well, I'm just following orders. That's not going to fly. Amen. There were some of those, those, those men at the, at the altar there said, I mean, at the uh, 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 cross that said, surely this is the Son of God. That's, that's pretty words, but hey, you just crucified him. Have you found yourself in that crowd yet? Yeah, Brother Ron, you know, I, I really do have things I want to hold on to. I really do have things I want to keep. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands from the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. But over in Acts, over in Acts, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, he said, Pilate slew Christ. You ever read that? He said, Pilate with wicked hands. He, he laid it at Pilate's Footstep. Even though Pilate had washed his hands, and no Pilate did it. Pilate's the one. You can't get out. When you, we all got to make that choice. There's always going to be pressures. There's always going to be things you got to give up. And the longer you go, the harder it becomes. Amen. You know. In verse 27, excuse me, verse 20 of chapter 27, the Bible says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. In this great crowd, there was also from folks that really <laughs> were just kind of townspeople. They just kind of came to see what was happening. They weren't active participants to begin with either way. They were curious and very fickle. You say fickle, Brother Ron? Yes, very fickle. Many of these very same people on this Thursday or Wednesday night, whichever one it was, when they were out to crucify Christ, because he was crucified on Thursday, not on Friday. Right? They call it Good Friday, but they couldn't have possibly have crucified him on Friday. If he's going to be in the grave three days and three nights, and he came up the third day, the third day, that would be Sunday, Saturday, Friday. So if he was going to be crucified and be in the grave three nights, then if he would have to be in there Saturday night, Friday night, and Thursday night. So we can't even get our days straight with the religious world out there. Should be good Thursday. Well, I mean, how long, how long did it take you to figure that out? About 30 seconds? They can't get it right because they don't want to get it right. Amen. Amen. People are curious and fickle. Amen. Many of these very same people that were being persuaded by this first group were the ones that were waving palms a week before and saying, Hosanna to the highest. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus Christ. This is our Savior. This is our King. And my, my friend... Uh, three or four days later, they're saying crucify him. Three or four days later, they're saying kill him. Get rid of him. That's why when it comes to trying to jump in with the crowd, I gave up trying to do that. Because they change too much. They're too fickle. Hey Amen. I don't fit in any crowd except the saints. That's the only crowd I fit into. The rest of those crowds, I can't fit into them because they change. One day they'll like me, and I say something, the next day they don't like me. 
Amen. The Bible says, woe unto you and all men speak well of you anyway. You're probably a politician. You're probably playing games. You're probably duplicitous and you're probably doing things you ought not been in. You got no business doing. That's probably what's wrong. <laughs> Amen. But if people, are, you know, they're just bystanders, as it were. They're just curious. They want to see what's happening. Yeah, let's go to church. We ain't got nothing else to do. Ball games are off and this and that. Let's just, let's just stop on by. Let's just see what's happening. Let's just see what this, let's just see what's going on. Kind of like a game to them. There's people that came out of their houses, I'm sure. What's all the noise? What's all, what's all that's going on? They said, oh, they're, they're doing something with Jesus. They said, well, really? And they just start walking and following. You know how it goes. Somebody out there get into a fight. And oh, man, there are folks off from everywhere. Folks peeking out from out of their shades. Up now. You know I'm telling the truth. That little accident happened down in the corner. Brother, there are folks coming out of like come out like ants. So where they come from? They two and three weeks, two and three weeks, two and three streets, <laughs> two and three streets over. Well, I, I'll get that out. And slow down. Two and three streets over. And here they are. You know they didn't follow the ambulance and heard the signs and watched the lights. And they all standing around talking about what? Well, what happened? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. oh what happened? Oh, where did check? Am I right? You know there were people like that in here. Those people didn't know what was going on. They were completely oblivious to what was really happening until somebody filled them in. But unfortunately, they was they were so pliant that they got kind of pushed around a little bit. Amen. Let me tell you something. If you follow the crowd, you're gonna wind up in a going to scrap heap. Amen. The crowd, most generally, is wrong. And again, the crowd is fickle. They love you one day and hate you the next. You know, I, was, I'm, I think about that time that Paul uh, uh, was, was on that island. And he, and he stuck his hand in some sticks. The Apostle Paul stuck his hand in some sticks. You can read this in Acts 26 or 25 or somewhere in there. And it said a viper, was it a viper? A viper latched his hand on him and bit him. And, he, and the Bible said Paul the, 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 the snake off into the fire. And the folks looked at him. And at first, they was ready to kill him. Yeah, they, well, they, but yeah, they thought he was going. Yeah, they thought he was going to die. And looked at him, and they're waiting for him to keel over. Surely this man, something wrong with him. Surely a, a, a snake wouldn't have come out and bitten him unless there was a problem with him. His spirits all messed up. And they looked at him. They were sitting there looking at him. And Paul just going on better about his business. You know, okay, well, let's, I guess it's time for prayer. Then praise the Lord. All right, how are you feel? They start kept looking at him. Next thing you know, the Bible says, they start worshiping him. You must be, you must be, oh, say, you must be, oh, great and mighty, you must be a god. The crowd's fickle. They'll love you today and hate you tomorrow. That's what helps us as saints. We can be like Paul when he said, the Lord delivered me from the people. What's that mean? That means if it's wrong... I stand against it. I don't care if it's my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, my children, and my uncle, or me. I still wrong. And if it's right, I'll stand for it if the whole world's against it. Amen. Give you some backbone. Give you some courage. Give you some authority. Amen. Give you some something down your soul to make a man or a woman out of you. That's what salvation will do for you. Amen. Deliver us from the crowd. Man, he's, you know, the crowd, I mean, they might pass a law and say marijuana smoking is fine. Brother, it's wrong to smoke. And I don't care whether you're smoking a peace pipe or you're smoking a cigar, whether you're smoking crack cocaine, whether you're freebasing, whether you're smoking a cigarette, amen, whatever you're smoking, if you're smoking, you're sinning. And I don't care if the whole United States government says it and the Supreme Court says it and they say it up in Canada, it's still wrong. Amen. They're working real hard to say that it's okay for men to marry men and women to marry women. Now, that should scare everybody in here. Amen. That should scare us all. 
to see Sally and Susie standing at the altar, you may salute the bride. But we've been so programmed here because the crowd's going that way. Because everybody seems to be saying it's okay. All they, they accuse us of being homophobic and you're an old fuddy oh, and you're, you're just intolerant and all. Yes, I am when it comes to that because the Bible is. I'm not intolerant to the people, but I'm intolerant to that behavior. It's sin. It's wrong. It's ungodliness. And people that do it are going straight to hell. Amen. Not trying to make excuses for Bill and Bob walking down the aisle together. That's wrong. It's sin. Amen. Sister Pam said he didn't make him Adam and Steve. He made him Adam and Eve. Amen. 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 But the crowd will say, "Oh, you, oh, you, you're unfair. Oh, oh, all of that. I mean, I mean, that's hate speech. And, oh, you, you, you're just afraid and and and, and you're discriminating. Oh, well, yeah, I guess I am." Yeah, I guess I am, but it's not because it's not on, on an irrational basis. I am discriminating against that. I don't want the, Bill and Bob asking my little boys next door so they can teach them how to be married to another man. No, I don't want that. Yeah, you're right. Amen. 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 I don't want my little girl going to school and reading about my, uh, 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 Betty had two mommies. I'm sorry, your name came out, sis. I'm sorry. I know you. My Lord. Amen. If it worked that way, then we wouldn't have a problem because we could procreate, but it doesn't work that way. Amen. My Lord. Amen. Amen. The crowd's fickle. The crowd is fickle. There were people in that crowd that were persuaded simply because somebody said do it. My Lord. My Lord. Amen. They said, they, they persuaded the crowd and said, crucify him. So they just started hollering. They hear somebody next to them, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they start, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They don't even know what they're talking about. Have no idea. Just push the wrong with the crowd. Amen. If there's anything you want to investigate, you want to investigate something about your soul. This is important. If you think we're lying, search the scriptures. Check them out. Amen. Investigate. Brother, I don't care. We can stay up late, get up early, turn over every rock. But I guarantee you that that which we preach, not just here, but wherever the true saints of God are, will deliver your soul from sin. We're not just making this up. People are not just jumping up and down to be showing off. This is a real experience because God has delivered us from that crowd out there rushing on and on in madness to the downward way and put us on the high road, the highway to heaven. That's why we rejoice. There may have been a time when I was in that crowd and I was crying, crucifying, crucifying, but God got a hold of me. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't even know what you're talking about, boy. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Amen. My Lord. Let them persuade you into smoking and drinking and carrying on because you think that's okay. Oh, here's something better. Amen. Dear one, in that crowd there were some disciples too. Amen. Matthew 26, 55. I'll be done shortly by the grace of God. It says here, in that same hour, said Jesus unto the multitude, are ye, are ye come out against us as against a thief with swords and staves? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures might be fulfilled, of the, prop, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. That doesn't sound very good. That doesn't sound very good. You know, almost every time you have a group of people gathered together, you'll find some disciple somewhere that's fled. This gospel has a way of stirring people in their soul. And people will come, be saved, and then the pressures and all this other stuff, time to time, will give them a change their position and they'll flee. What do you mean by that? I mean, they'll backslide, they'll run, they'll change their love, appreciation for God, go off in a different direction. Or be like Peter. The Bible says he followed him what? Afar off. The disciples had a vested interest. 
in this. Amen. But because of the way it began to unfold before them, they became disoriented themselves. They became very confused. And that was disappointing. Now, in the audience this size, we're always going to find somebody like that. Guess what? Peter made his way back. Judas didn't. One of the two. Which one will you be? It's a huge crowd that day. And you got the scribes over here and they got their interest. You got the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders. They all got their little interest. And then you got the political leaders and the Romans and they've got their interest. Then you got the general population and they don't know what's going on. And then you got those that were close and have a real intimate knowledge of this truth and know what it is and what Jesus had prophesied to them. And even some of them allowed themselves to be pushed to the brink. And he went back. Before the, when Jesus talked to Peter, he said, before the cock crow, what? Thrice, you what? You die, deny me. Before the cock crow twice, you shall deny me thrice. And he did. By the time he got done, Brother Bruce, I think the man was lying, swearing, and saying bad words, cursing. Before that night was over. And prior to that, he had promised Jesus. In fact, he had rebuked him and said, you know what? I'll always stay with you. And, and you can be sure, you can count on me if you can't count on anybody else. And he said, I will never leave you. That's what he said. You know, you count on me. You don't have to worry about me. And before the night was over, before the cock a doodle doo went off, right? He had already denied him three times. And it got worse, progressively worse. The first time he just lied and said, well, I don't, I don't really know the man. The second time he lied and he swore. He said, I swear I don't know him. You know, and then we're told not to do that. Swear not at all. So he lied and he swore. He said, no, I don't know him. I swear to you I don't know him. You know how people do that. That's supposed to really impress you. I swear on my grandmother's grave. We don't say that. That's what I'm talking about. That's kind of stuff. Well, I swear by, I swear to, you know, he said, I swear to God. I don't know him. And then it said, some little lady said, well, you don't know. I can tell by the way you talk. Your speech betrays it. Well, oh, you tell the way I talk. I'm going to show you. I don't talk the way you can figure that out. So he began to, he swore, he lied, and then he started some bad words. Now, how's that for speech? You know they don't talk like that. And the Bible said that P Peter was close enough that Jesus was in Pilate's hall, and he looked out and saw him, connected with him, looked at him. And when they made eye contact, when they made eye contact, the Bible said it just crushed Peter. And he wept bitterly. My God, my God, I'm not saved anymore. I'm not yours anymore. I've sinned, I've backslidden. My God, have mercy on me. I'm wretched. I'm undone. I'm condemned. Look what I've done. I've lost my soul. is lost again, Lord. My soul is lost again. After three years of being with you, my God, after seeing all the healings and the work you did, my God, I'm not saved again. Have mercy on me. He swept bitterly. Bitterly. That's one thing to cry. But when you weep bitter tears, that means, you know how people, when they have bitter tears, their body just hunches. And the tears just flow. There's no stopping them. They just run like water. Can we find you in this crowd? Have you found yourself? One last group. This is a pretty small group. This group only consisted of a couple of guys. A couple of thieves. And a guy named Barabbas. Three pretty bad individuals. Barabbas kind of got let go. And I'm sure that he was trying to figure out what in the world's going on here. He's probably like, they should have offed me. The Bible says he was an insurrectionist, a murderer, and a thief. He's a robber. I mean, he, had, he was to receive the death penalty. Thank you. Capital punishment was to be his. And uh, he's there with all the proceedings and in the kangaroo court, 
Speaking of somebody being framed, right? I mean, his due process was certainly violated. Wouldn't you say? He didn't receive his due process. What was it called? The habeas corpus or whatever it is? He didn't receive his due process. He was not fairly treated. He was convicted. He was presumed guilty. <laughs> he had to prove himself. He had to prove a negative. He was trying to prove that he didn't do what they said. And here's Barabbas probably looking at all of this and thinking, man, this is pretty wild. He's probably head swirly, trying to wonder what's going on. Maybe he heard Jesus, maybe not, who knows? Probably did, but he's probably thinking to himself, man, it's kind of strange. And then there were two other thieves, two other fellows that just didn't quite get away like that. Jesus took Barabbas' place, but the other two guys, they didn't get away. And uh, while they were nailing Jesus to the cross, they nailed these other two fellows to their crosses. Pretty small group. But let me tell you something about that group that's much different than the rest. That group had a definite sense of urgency. <laughs> let, me tell, let me put it to this way. If somebody's nailing you to the cross and you're not saved, and they say the Messiah's next to you, the one that can save you, you better be trying to find out real quick whether he can or not. <laughs> you don't have time to procrastinate and make excuses and Talk about what you're going to do later on or some other. No, you don't. No, you. No. And they were both up there and they started talking to him. And one's mouth, you know, he's going off on a, on a, on a tangent. He's he talking kind of crazy and weird and saying stuff. And they're like, Jesus looking. And, and, and the other thief looked over at him and said, man, be quiet. He said, we're up here because we deserve to be. We're up here because we ought to be. You know and I know that you and I are both wrong. But this man's up here, he's innocent. This man has not done anything wrong. He's not up here because he did the wrong thing. He's up here and being mistreated. And then that one thief looked over to him and said, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. I don't feel like I got enough time. I'm not getting down from here alive. I'm on the edge here. I've messed around. My life has escaped me. Here I am. I'm getting ready to be taken out of here. I don't have time to dilly-dally and piddle around. I need you now. I want you to remember me when you go to your father. I want you to remember me now. Remember me. I said, Jesus looked over at it. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There he is at the brink of utter destruction. Yeah. Few more moments, his life would escape, and he's going straight to hell and spend eternity there, rising in flames of despair forevermore. In the last few minutes, he said, Lord, remember me. Will you remember me? I know I deserve to be here. And I know you don't. I know I'm wrong. I know you're right. But save me. I've got nothing here to offer you. I've got nothing to bring to you. I can't get down from here and, and live for you. I can't spread your gospel. I can't be of any help. But Lord, if there's any mercy, remember me. Lord, just pour out mercy. They say you're the Messiah. They say you came to save mankind. I need to be saved. Will you save me? The Bible said Jesus answered him. Out oh, all that, all that pain and anger. What did he say, brother? Verily, truly. Amen. Don't be mistaken here, young man. Truly, I say unto you, today, today, when you die, when your life is taken from you, when you expire and leave this world, today you'll be with me. Oh, oh, that must have rung down in his soul. Oh, that must have made him feel. Praise God, I'm ready to die now. Take my life. Take it, praise God. Because Jesus said, today. Man, what a comforting knowledge. Amen. Amen. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Woo! And when he died, I did what? When he died, 
Jesus took him just like he said. Some people right here on the edge of disaster. Your, your life is messed up. Amen. It's been turned inside out and upside down. Amen. You're at your wit's end and you're crying out one place to another. But what you need to do is look to Messiah. You need to look to the Savior and say, Lord, 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 remember me. Remember David. Remember Neil. Amen. Remember Ida. Remember Jim. Remember Scotty. Amen. Amen. Remember this young man. Lord, remember me. Remember Chris. Amen. God will do a work. God will do a work. Amen. You got to locate yourself in this crowd. Amen. Well, of all those people that we talked about, amen, the, the pilot may have gone his way and lived many years. Amen. The Pharisees and the Sadducees may have gone out and done their own thing. But most of the rest of the crowd that didn't know what was happening could have gone back to their houses and had their steak dinners and had a good time. And brother, some of the disciples may have gone hither and yonder. One of them just didn't make it. But of all the people that day, the most blessed, the most blessed of all was that thief. Yes, it was. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he was the most blessed. Amen. He was the most blessed. Ooh. Amen. You'd have thought he was off the worst off. No, I said, weep not for me. I made it in. By the skin of my teeth, but I'm here. Woo! If we behave ourselves, one day we'll be able to walk up here. Man, you barely made it. He'll say, yeah, I barely made it, but I made it. Woo! Glory to God. I made it. Well, praise our God. Amen. It was a close call. I mean, I was almost gone. I mean, I was going down for the last time. But I made it. Whoa. Glory to God. I'm here. Oh, praise God. Man, it's a big crowd that day. It's a big crowd that day. Hey, Amen. you got to find yourself. Amen. You got to find yourself. They all needed repentance. But only one of them really got it. Amen. That day. Amen. They all needed help. Amen. But only one of them really got it. Amen. That day. Amen. And that was a blessed day for him. Amen. That was a blessed day for him. Oh, that was a blessed Amen. day for him. Amen. And you can make today. March whatever it is. A blessed day. March 27, 2005. Yeah. You can make it a blessed day for you as we stand. Amen. Amen.